Hi, this is Skip Bayless. I just had a long session with Kara and she got me to talk about things I've never talked about before in my life about my life. Well, you might want to convince me I'm wrong. Okay. I might analyze you okay. a little and then you right. could take that. Okay. So, okay, so I do have a little theory when you're talking okay. about growing up and getting into fights. Because mm -hmm. we talked about your childhood mm -hmm. and you really have risen above mm -hmm. a very challenging childhood. It was. So you it have was. you had mm -hmm. two parents who were alcoholic. Both. In different right. ways. Very different. One, my father, a um, what they call a functional alcoholic who would seriously wake up in the morning and pour himself a drink immediately. That was like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And he would just drink all day, but he could function okay. He was always just a little off. My mother was a drunk drunk who would drink and just immediately get tipsy, goofy, silly, embarrassingly drunk, slurry drunk, not my father who could just, he could, he ran this little hole in the wall barbecue restaurant on the sort of south side of Oklahoma City in a really rough neighborhood, but he could function through the day, but he's constantly pouring himself, he'd drink vodka with Coke, and and again, my mother would always say vodka is the killer, because you, you can't even taste it, but it'll get you, she, she would always say, it'll get you drunker faster than anything. I don't know anything about it, but when I was, I was the oldest. When I was three or four, I have vivid memories. They would throw parties at our little tiny house, two bedrooms, one bath, on 43rd Street in Oklahoma City. And they had this circle of friends who would come over and they all just drank like fish. And the parlor game, their party game with me was, my father would call me over. I, was, I couldn't have been more than three or four. And you can say, how far back does your memory go? Well, I've got one of those autobiographical memories where I, I can remember what I got for Christmas when I was four, like it was yesterday. And I can remember walking in to see it under the Christmas tree because it was a bicycle. But my point is, I can remember the party and he would pour me a drink of some, it, it was more like bourbon or something. I don't know, it was, it was straight, whatever it was, in a cup and say, try this. And of course, I would try it and I would do the old bitter beer face thing and just run and spit it out because it was horrible. But he, that was the greatest favor he could have ever done me because later when he was in rehab like three different times, I would have to go to the rehab at the Veterans Hospital in Oklahoma City and sit with the psychiatrist, this female psychiatrist at one point asked me, I was 14, she said, do you drink alcohol? I said, no, I don't. I've never even t tried it except when he gave it to me for the, in, at the party. And she would say, well, don't start because you are doubly genetically predisposed to this. And so, because it tasted so bitter to me, it was like castor oil bitter, which is what a kid's mouth would, that you haven't sort of learned. Uh, it, it's like you have to learn to like that taste, I think. I don't know, but I, I never tried mm -hmm. it again, so. And that happened at one party? Several parties. They, they, I remember it several times happening. I think say, also. Try this. Okay. So as like a but they as would a all laugh at me. Piece of yes, entertainment, it was, it was entertaining piece of entertainment. Yes, because they would all get a big laugh out of how I would run and spit it out. So I think it's beyond the taste, the fact that you didn't like the taste of it, because yeah. I'm sure even though you were little, mm -hmm. you were understanding something is not right in this situation here. I would agree. So that yeah. probably is so deeply embedded yeah. in you mm -hmm. that that has helped you also never it wanna helped. do any of that. It has helped me, but he was just a bad guy with a bad heart. And I always ask my mother, why did you marry him? And she, she would always say, he's handsome. He looked really? like Paul Newman. She always say, "He looks like Paul." You know Paul Newman? Is of that course. okay? Okay. So, and maybe a little he did, but th neither one of them graduated from high school. And they stayed married. So even was it just the Paul Newman looks, or is I mean, that he because he finally left and he ran off with one of her closest friends who lived three houses down from us, and they ran off and moved to Tulsa, and he tried to start another little barbecue restaurant that failed miserably, but um, but he left when I was 
maybe 16, 15 or 16. I think I was a sophomore in high school. Okay, so you, and you're the oldest of, Three. you have a brother mm -hmm. and a sister? Mm -hmm. She's not with us anymore. Oh, I'm Lost sorry. Lost her to breast cancer, but anyway, okay, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But my brother lives in Chicago and is a big restaurateur in Chicago. And he, he won in this because we were, the two of us were forced to work in the little hole-in-the-wall barbecue restaurant and I despised it and my brother literally so to speak ate it up because my father would do everything he would cook we'd have to go in the summer at four o'clock in the morning because he would cook ribs and so you'd have to start the process of cooking and then he would make me do what they call preparation work which is this is pre all the fancy gadget machines that they have. So I had to take the giant butcher knife and chop like green peppers into little pieces to go in the potato salad. Help me out, I don't even know what it okay, was. Okay, because somebody commented on that recently because okay. I think you told me this last time yeah. and they said something about green peppers and potato salad, that's Okay, well they had a, he had a special oh, recipe. They, they had everything perfect. special, Explained. okay? Because the ribs were, spe the sauce was special. Um, the baked beans were special. He that they were trying to sell that we do it differently, definitely. but they, they put definitely green peppers in the potato salad to give it a, a, a flavor, pop the taste uh, uh -huh. a little bit. So, but I, you hated every you, minute of that. But I told you I was when I, I, I was so not into it yeah. that I wouldn't even focus, and so I would wash the green peppers. And then I would have to take the giant butcher knife and, and, and then do it into force and then take it like this and, and chop it up. And one morning I washed it and I wasn't paying much attention and the knife just slipped right off and I still have a big scar across there. I just cut my finger right to the bone. I looked down at it, I could see the bone. I was like, what did I just do? Because it happened so fast and the knife is so big and sharp that I, I hadn't thought well, I could do it to you too. And so I looked down and he was in his office getting ready. It was right before we were gonna open at 11. And lunch was bigger for us than dinner because it's a bad part of town. People didn't go out to dinner. So they, whatever money he could make was off lunch at 11. And I walked into the office and we didn't get along at all. And I said, you're gonna have to take me to the hospital because I knew I needed stitches because it was just wide open. And he was like, oh God. Okay, come on, let's go. And we went to the, it's called Capitol Hill in Oklahoma City. We went to the Capitol Hill Hospital and they gave me eight or 10 stitches, whatever it was, and I went back and worked because that's what we did. So, but my brother. Would, Your brother is Rick Bayless, Rick. just to be clear, because a lot yes. of people are so surprised when they hear <laughs> that you're yeah. brothers. Okay. Um, we were never close because I love sports and he did not, so we had zero in common, but he went that direction. Uh -huh. So the best thing that ever happened to him was what was called the Hickory House, was the name of that the little the joint, restaurant. The it was a joint. joint, it was a barbecue joint. Uh -huh. And it, it was a springboard for him because my father just let him start cook. He would cook the ribs and he would do everything. And then I had to even do French fries. I would have to chop it up. I was doing everything, all the junk work. You know, I was doing the little stuff and he was doing the big stuff. Uh, okay. So, but it, only once did I ask my father about ribs because they were very proud of whatever their sauce was. I hated ribs. In fact, I can't tell you how many nights I came home from basketball or baseball practice and my mother would just leave ribs in the oven on low because she didn't cook and so it'd be like mm -hmm. I would have what, what came from the Hickory House. And so I grew up on ribs and I never liked them particularly but at one point he was taking me home one night and he was pretty drunk because he, he would get a big vodka and coke to take home. I don't know how we didn't have a wreck, but we didn't. And there were no seat belts worn at this time. So we get in the car, there's actually a panel truck that he drove home and, and I said, are, are your ribs supposed to be the best in town? And he said, no, no, the best are over at this place. I said, I don't know anything about this place. And he said, well, it's on the Northeast side. Well, the Northeast side of Oklahoma City is all black. It's a very black community. In those days, it was much more segregated than it is today. And I'm like, oh, 
do you know where it is? He said, yeah, I've been over there for lunch. He said, let's go now. I'll, I'll just get you. And it's Saturday night at 10 o'clock. And I'm like, I don't know if this is the best idea. And we go over and it's, it's like um, a black community honky tonk. And I just told him I'm probably 10 and I'm smart enough to know that this is not a good idea because we're just two white people. We can't just walk in there at this late. Now it's 1030 on Saturday night and it was hopping. And he said, I'm going. And, and he was just drunk. And I'm saying, we're, we're just going to get killed. You know, this, this is just not right. So I went with him and we walked in the door and they all stopped and looked at us because I'm not sure many white people ever went over there into that club at that hour, especially. And he walked right up to the bar and, and said, I want how he ordered the ribs to go. And the guy looked at us like these people are crazy. And maybe it helped that I was there because I was a little kid. And so they're just looking at us like, what are they doing? And I was so embarrassed, but they gave us the ribs and we went right out and we sat in his truck in the parking lot and ate the ribs. And they were good. They were better than they our ribs. They were good. They so were you good. liked ribs for the first that time in your life. That was the first time. I liked the sauce better than our sauce. But that was how crazy my father was. Right. So he had like no judgment at all, it No judgment. Like. No. And was he mean to you also? He he just wanted me badly to fail because he knew I was smarter than he was from the start and he and I was I was a good athlete always coming up especially up through 14 or 15 I was often the best athlete and he had nothing to do with it he never came he he put me down he just he told me I would never he, he wanted me to be an auto mechanic he said you need to learn to work on cars because that you can make some money doing that. There, there always, uh, there'll be always be a need for mechanics. And I'm like, I'm, I have no interest. I like to drive cars and fast cars, but I didn't want to work on cars. And so we clashed over that, and then we ended when I was 16 at the restaurant. It's not even a restaurant; it was a joint. He would cater parties occasionally in a giant sort of van. It was, it was kind of this beat up, run down old van. And it, you could walk in the back of it. So I was, ha I was forced to work and it was in the summertime. And he, we, we had cookers of ribs that had plastic handles on the side, but the tops were, were metal and it, they were hot, hot like burn your hand hot. So I'm up in the van and he's supposed to hand the cookers to me and he started throwing the cooker where I had to try to catch the handles. And he was just dumb drunk by that. I mean, he was functional, but, but he was just completely off. So he did, when he threw the first one, I said, don't do that again. And of course he tried it again and he threw it to me and I just, I caught it. And I put it down and I got out and we're out in the parking lot where people can see. And he says, what do you think you're going to do about it? And, and I said, you're just not going to do that again. He said, what are you going to do? Whip my ass? And I said, if you want, I'm right here. And he came at me and threw a big roundhouse punch and I just decked him one time, one shot and knocked him back. It was easy. <laughs> there was no contest. And he said, I'll never forget go home to your mother. And I said, thank you very much. I'm out. And I never went back. So at least I got out of having to work in the summers at the Hickory House. So that was the end of that. And how did your relationship change after that? Or did it? I never spoke to him again. He, that was the last time you mm -hmm. talked to him? I never spoke to him. So how did you deal with that? after i mean it's you, you were dealing with it on the surface mm -hmm. but it was still inside of you so i just knew that i had to get out and my only way out was somehow through school and maybe sports so they always say the children of alcoholics can overachieve mm -hmm. and so I didn't know it at the time, but remember I'm the oldest, so I'm having to figure this out on the fly because nobody's, I don't, I don't have a big brother and I don't have either parent to guide or counsel. Mm -hmm. 
And Can I interrupt you for a yes. second? So did the did the three of you come together at all, or did you kind of each just fend for yourself to survival mode? They, Meaning that you and your yes, brother and sister. They bonded, which I never quite understood, but I tried to be close to my sister, but she loved him, which is cool by me, and they just sort of stayed together because I, I pretty soon left them behind to have to deal with the mess, which is, I just couldn't help it. I. I was able to, thanks to the journalism teacher at my high school, I had like an act of God where I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I took an advanced English class. I was always smart. I don't know where I got it from because I, I don't really see it in them, but whatever. It could just, be there, but it was just it dormant was because, yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe. Or buried, right, maybe. because of the alcohol. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. I never you don't really think saw so. it. Did you I have a, Did you have like a grandparent or anybody no. who you? Mm -mm. Did you have any like older relatives mm -mm. or extended family? No, I, they were there, but th th they weren't there for me. So nobody was there for you, mm -mm. even your extended. I was flying solo. So and, and I also tell you, my mother had no rules for me, so it was really great because I had no curfew. I had no no nothing. I could just go wherever I wanted. And the other quick point of order was when I was 14, my mother was so tired of having to take me to any baseball, basketball, football game or practice. She said, let's, let's get you a motorcycle. Well, nobody in my neighborhood had a motorcycle because they were like taboo because the other parents thought they were death traps, which mm -hmm. they, they frankly were. You can't have a fender bender on a motorcycle, especially when you're 14. You're probably going to die or really get hurt badly. And amazingly, my father was the one who said, you, you can't do that. There, he, he was the one who said, you're, you're going to die on a motorcycle. But my mother said, nope, he can handle it. She did believe in me because I was mature for my age. And she said, just, just get him a motorcycle for his birthday. And they, they were cheap They were because we didn't have a lot of money, but they could afford what was called a Honda 90. There were nothing. I don't know what they were, like $200 or something. But it, it, was, it was an expenditure for him. But for her, it was gold because she didn't have to take me yeah, anymore. Off the hook. Off the hook completely because she was having her own issues. So I was mobile. I could go anywhere and do anything I wanted. And I could have gone uh, you know, sort of figuratively south, but I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. So I, again, so I had transportation, and then now I'm a sophomore in high school. In the first day of school, I wind up in the advanced English class taught by the journalism teacher, and she taught one class a day only to see if she could find writers for her school newspaper. So the first day she assigns us a book report, one page. I want one page. You can pick any book you want. I just want to see if you can write. So we're all 15 or 16 years old. I'd never written more than my name. So I had no, no thought about it. I had no aptitude for it. I'd, I'd never tried. And of course, I went to the library after school and got a sports biography. And I thought it was terrible. It felt like I read it overnight because it felt like it had been written in a night. And I wrote a scathing review of said book that I was embarrassed for the guy who wrote it. And on Friday, after she had read the papers, when the bell rang, she said, Skip Bayless, I want to see you at my desk after class. And she was scary. She had big black hair. Her name was Elizabeth Burdett. Everybody was afraid of her. She had a screechy voice, and she was hard on, on kids that didn't measure up she would humiliate people in class. And my friends looked at me like, what did you do? I don't know. I don't know. And I go up to her desk and she said, you are coming into journalism. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't have any interest. I'm sorry. I don't. It doesn't matter. You're going to write me two columns a week, two sports columns a week. I said, I, I just don't, I don't care enough about it. And she said, you don't have to edit stories or they had like folding parties every Thursday night for the Friday where you'd have to fold the papers up. She said, you don't have to do any of that. I just need two columns a week. And it changed my life because somehow I could write. I don't know where it came from. No writers anywhere in the extended mm -hmm. family. Does she know how successful you became? Yes. She does. She, she's not with us anymore, but in 2000, 
and nine, they inducted me into the Oklahoma City Public Schools Hall of Fame in a big gala in Oklahoma City. It's 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 a pretty big deal. I know it sounds little, but it's it's pretty big. Sure. A lot of prominent people come, and it's a big dress-up thing, black tie, and I forget who I am. Maybe she came, and she was 90 years old, but she came that night, and I was able to, from as I accepted, to, to thank her. And we have always, we kept in touch. She died maybe three months after that. Amazing. But she got she to got see to it. She got to that. the satisfaction of she did this. She made me who I was. And finally, my senior year, she knew about this scholarship at Vanderbilt that I never, I didn't even know what Vanderbilt was. And it was called the Grant and Rice Scholarship, and it's a full ride. It was twenty-five thousand dollars in nineteen seventy, which was a ton of. It was the full. It was room board books. Four years. All four years done. There is no way at that point my mother could have, because she tried to run the little barbecue joint by herself and failed miserably, so there was no way I was going anywhere but the University of Oklahoma where everybody, all my friends went. And Liz Burdett entered me in it and she impressed upon me, you have to take the SAT and you have to get accepted to Vanderbilt or, or you're not qualified to be even in the scholarship competition. I made really good grades, but I didn't know anything about the SAT. I didn't. These kids today have all these yeah it's, different it's, worlds. This is a whole different yeah. world. Okay, as you well know. But <laughs> quick, crazy thank you God story was the SAT was on the morning of December the second, and it was the only time th that you could take it in Oklahoma City for the year. And, and obviously, this is the end of the line because you're yeah, you, you're going to the colleges yes, right yes. after. Okay, so it was at a little Catholic school called McGinnis High School, which is about thirty minutes from where I lived, and I knew McGinnis, and I even went over the day before to to drive around to find the classroom where it was, so I knew where I was going to go, but. We had a high school football game that night. I did not play football. I played basketball and baseball. But we, all the basketball team went to the game, and it was out of town. And the traffic was bad coming back, and I got back late. And for the only time in my life, I forgot to turn my alarm on. And I don't know what possessed me, but I was just wiped out from a long day. And I got in bed, and I fell asleep hard with no alarm. And I woke up at 20 till 9, when, and this started at 9. And I broke every s speed record. I, I, I set a land speed record mm -hmm. driving across Oklahoma City to McGinnis, and I got there somehow at five after nine. And the presiding nun looked at me scornfully and gave me a shake of the head. And then I was like, please. And she handed me the booklet and the pencil required to mark the booklet, and she said, and so I'm five minutes late, and they're all just furiously going. And it's all these private school kids, because I was at a public school. And a number of them went to Vanderbilt, actually. And I got to know them, but I went to the very back of the class, and I, I just went into hyperspace and frantically, desperately answered the questions as fast as I could, and I aced it. And I don't know how. I didn't prep for it, I didn't do pre-SAT, I didn't do anything. And if if she hadn't given me that booklet, I don't know where I'm not sure I'd be mm -hmm, sitting here mm -hmm. right now because I won the scholarship. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. interesting because there are these people who have made such a positive impact mm -hmm. on you, mm -hmm. and like right, just by handing by saying, "Okay, fine, go." It, that, that's a turning point in my life. Yeah. No, it's it's like make or break. Cause she said, "Okay, go," because she gave me a look like, "How dare you?" Right, do right. This, this is you the punk. SAT. Right. Yeah. And then she goes, "Okay, just goes." You know, good luck. So, and, and then, yeah. so so, they don't pick the scholarship winner. It's weird until May. It's it's the week. It's the Monday after the Kentucky Derby because they would have prominent sports writers come to Nashville after the Kentucky Derby to go over the 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 final ten and pick the one. So I'd forgotten all about it. I didn't even know where Vanderbilt was. Never seen Vanderbilt. I come in from baseball practice, my ribs are in the oven, 
and my mother had left me a note and she never left me a note she left it on the breakfast table just prominently a note call area code 615 well it's nashville and i as soon as i saw 615 i said i won the scholarship because it had to be they're not going to call me to tell me i lost so i made the long distance call and the guy says we need to know by tomorrow if you're coming and i'm like because I had a girlfriend that I was very close with for four years and she was a year behind me and I knew she was going to be homecoming queen and head cheerleader and everything her senior year. So if I'm going to OU, which is 30 minutes away, University of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. then I can be with her. But I just, I said, okay, I'll call you tomorrow morning. He said, yes, that's the latest. You can call me tomorrow morning and just tell me whether you're going to take it. And I hung up and I thought, why didn't I just take it then? Because I gotta, I gotta go because I looked around at where I was and I said, I'm free. I'm, I'm, I got my ticket out. And so I, I did, I have to call my girlfriend and I said, I'm your, and the irony is she, she wound up coming to Vanderbilt. She went to Vanderbilt a year after me. Interesting. We did get married. It was a bad idea because we were sort of brother and sister by then, but I still close with her and she's great. And, but the point was I picked up and left and I left my brother and sister in a bit of a mess. I did. They weren't as able to cope maybe with it. And my mother just fell completely apart at that point. So they were sort of left with the ruins of the house. And so it made them closer and me more sort of estranged from that. But Did you stop talking to them at that no, point completely? No. So you've kept in touch. I have, but just never had a connection with my brother. I can't tell you how different we are. And it's almost like, how did we come out of the same womb? So like, how, how are different? Happen? Like, so how are you different? Different how? I mean, not just your interest in sports versus cooking. And that's the key. That's the um, key. Yes. Thing? Yes, because there's no common language you know there's no but there's a common crisis you went through yeah we did do that, that i don't know i can't explain it you're asking a really good question that i don't have a very good answer for you I don't just have to have an had, answer for it i didn't just, have a it connection is interesting. we just went our separate ways and i love him and i i mean we shared a bunk bed all the way to let's see when we get our own rooms we, we had to add on a room um I finally got my own. I guess I was eighth, ninth, ninth grade. I'll say ninth grade. Yeah. So, so my point is, I slept on the top bunk and he slept on the bottom bunk for the first. Let's see, ninth grade, you'd be fourteen to fifty. Say fourteen. Yeah. Fourteen years. Yeah. Uh, well, he was two years later than me, but so that's but you twelve weren't years. Close, even all those years. You're saying even mm -hmm. one bunk bed or one one mm -hmm. bed away from each other. Mm -hmm. We're you never were never close. close. I don't know why. It's just so, he was so different from me. He was the flip side of me. He wasn't competitive like I am. He wasn't um, obsessed with with being an athlete the way I was just obsessed. I was, and I was really good up through eighth grade. Speaking of McGinnis High School, they had a basketball camp at McGinnis, I arrived. That, that high school had a, played a real powerful sort of turning point in my life, but there's a basketball camp for kids from all over Texas and Oklahoma that was famous that they had every summer. And when I was 14, after my eighth grade year, I won most valuable player at the camp. And it was a big deal. And there was a story about it in the paper the next day that I still have. And I grew fast mm. and I was physical and very competitive for my size. And then by 16, 17, everybody grew above me. So I just got my growth fast. Okay. So, so all that's counter to everything. My brother, he was just different. He was very creative, but artsy creative. And I was school, I, I was writing creative. Right. You're but, very intellectual. Yes, but he was, he liked to, um, you know, um, do ceramics. You make ceramics. He liked to paint. Um, he, I think for a while, he's making some of his own clothes. So he liked to do all the arty stuff. And in school, he, he was in thespians and I don't think 
he was in the band, but he played the piano. I don't remember. We, we were told different social groups. So, I don't know. You just were never, right? It was just mm-hmm. never. No. And then what happened after? And then he started to have his own path of success. Mm-hmm. Like, was it parallel to yours? Or, and like, how did you, were you in touch at that point? We kept in touch, but mostly through like Christmas, birthday kind of things. Uh-huh. But he had a hard time with my mother. I don't even know what happened because I wasn't there. It was terrible. But he didn't talk to you about it, or your sister no, didn't talk mm-mm. to you about it? No, because she just knew my it was mother bad. just crashed and burned. They took her, thank them for both of this, they took her to AA, to Alcoholics Anonymous, and it saved her. It clicked. It did. Yes. So she, she was went the one. and she, she went when I was invested. in college. I was away. Well, maybe I was a sophomore. She remarried a guy who's another bad guy, and it was just a disaster. And then I came home and she was such a wreck for when I came home for Christmas and it was probably my junior year then um they finally said you're gonna die she had a bad car wreck drunk driving drunk um was in the hospital for a while I don't even know anything about it because I was gone to Mm. school and in those days it was once you went away we didn't have cell phones so it's harder to stay connected yeah totally different very different It's like writing letters, you know, yeah. like snail mail letters. Or like long you, distance phone call. Yeah, which I didn't do because I didn't have any money. So um, it is, it's impossible to stay in touch. I only saw my mother when I went home for Christmas or summer. So in the end, they took her by the hand and led her to AA. I think it's my junior year. And from that moment on she never missed a meeting the rest of her born days she went every monday night and she would always tell me i can't make it without the meeting Mm -hmm. and she lived a pretty good life and then i did get my athletic ability from her she was a really good athlete and so at 50 years of age she took up golf and immediately within a year she became the club champion she won Mm -hmm. it like I don't know, 10 times over the next 15 years. So what happened after she died in terms of your thoughts about everything, your relationship with Mm. Rick and your sister and all of it? Was there a shift for you? We all went back for the memorial. We had a memorial service for her. Um, I don't know. That's another good question. If I'm being completely candid... When I can't remember, I think my brother's wife called me to say she passed. And I was talking to her every day, but I did not go back. I just couldn't face it, to be honest with you. But I knew she wasn't going to make it because I kept talking to the doctor, a woman who would tell me her kidney's shot and she's just, it's a matter of hours now. And I talked to her one last time and she was incoherent. And then when Rick's wife named Deanne called me, I think she texted me, she's gone. You know, I cried because it got me because of all we went through, but it's hard to have love for her when she had very little for me because I was unloved. I mean, she would never tell me I love you or we were, like Ernestine always says, didn't you ever touch, you know, didn't you ever like hug each other? Nope. Nope. It was cold, cold blooded. And remember my mother did not want children. Her mother pressured her to have three children. And so my mother being the good daughter that she wanted to be, cause she was fighting with her alcohol so much. She had the three children and she, <laughs> the other thing that saved me, The only rule we had was we had to go to church every Sunday, only so her mother would see us at the service and it would impress my grandmother named Gladys. Oh, well, she's doing okay because she got her kids Mm. to church, right? And so church was good for me because it kept me from going the wrong direction, which I easily could have done. It's hard because it's complex. Like she was your mother. Yeah. And but there was you didn't feel love, but then you probably wonder, well, maybe there was love, but she wasn't yeah. able to show it. I don't know. Maybe it's very it's a it's hard deep. thing to sort through. Yeah, but she, it's it's like 
<laughs> in high school, they would give you your grades each quarter on a little slip and you would have to take it home and get one parent to sign it to bring it back. And so I made one B in, in four years of high school in driver's ed because they didn't give A's because they wouldn't give them because they didn't want kids to be overconfident behind the wheel. So if okay. you took driver's ed, which I did in the summer, summer school, everybody got a B or worse. So I had one B thanks to driver's ed and I was the salutatorian in my class as opposed to the valedictorian because Justine Coyle, with whom I had some classes, did not take driver's ed. She didn't have a car, she didn't drive. I didn't know her very well. She became an anesthesiologist after she went to Harvard, but she became valedictorian because she didn't take driver's ed and that always rankles me. It sticks in my so, craw. I know it's crazy, yeah. but that's, that's what happened, I'm competitive. So the point is I would take the, the every every quarter I would have, how many classes do you have? Six? I think you have six. Probably, yeah. And and I would go, A, 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 A. And I think, well, I'll see what they think about this. And I'd just put it on the breakfast table. And one or the other would pass by at some point in the next 24 hours and just scribble on it. But they would never say a word to me. So I go through four years of high school. And every time I'm bringing it home, except for summer school, it, it has six A's on it. And nothing. nothing. And so it drove me to say, Okay, watch this. Watch what I do. Because they, neither of them ever read a book in their life. And, and all I did was read. I was a voracious reader. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. all these things turned <laughs> you into you. Yeah. Obviously. They did. It's a, but right. I'm, I'm thankful for everything I just told you made me exactly who I am right here, right now. Okay, we have to wrap up, but I don't, I want to okay. ask you a couple of quick questions sure. before you have to speed okay. out of here. So, what would you say to your mother right now, if you could say anything that you would want her to know? Hmm. That's interesting. So real quick, just so you get this, my grandmother had a woman who worked for her named Katie Bell Henderson, a black woman from the South side of Chicago. And because my home life was such a wreck, I often got left at my grandmother's, especially on weekends. And this was not one of those, the help situations. Katie Bell was a, her own woman. And my grandmother traveled for her work and didn't have a lot of money, but Katie Bell just ran the household. So it wasn't like some plantation mentality thing. I didn't even know about that as a kid because I was unaware. And Katie Bell, became my mother and she taught me everything I know about right from wrong and she was hard on me she would call me a hypocrite before I even understood what the hypocrite what the word meant and she raised me as my mother far more than my mother did and it, it helped me in race relations I can see the big picture because I loved her I I, I lived with her she would take me to church occasionally, to an all black church, what was called an AME church in Oklahoma City on the Northeast side. I went a number of times and I would be the only, I'd be 10 or 11 years old, and I'd be the only white person in the church. And they would treat me like a prince. And I would be astounded at how emotional they all got during the service because white people don't get emotional during services where they talk to the preacher or, the, the joy with which they sang and it was just it was so much fun it was so eye-opening to me so you, you have to understand that was that was my mother okay. so just to to put an exclamation point on this about um two years ago my wife ernestine said she had met this shaman through texts and it's, it's a long story but he He's a black man who lives in New York. And so he will read for you over the phone. And I didn't really buy it, but she said, his name is Joseph. And she said, you should talk to Joseph. And I said, about what? And she said, I don't know. He'll, he'll just give you some, he'll put your life in perspective in ways you're not able to. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try this. So I tried to be as open-minded as possible. Joseph knows nothing about me. 
to my knowledge. I, I, there's no way he could know any of this. So I get on the phone with Joseph, and he, he, he's very spiritual. He said, well, we have to pray for us, so we prayed, and I appreciated that. So it felt grounded to me. It didn't feel phony or tricked up. Or yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're five minutes in, and he says, hmm, somebody wants to join us. And I'm like, what? And I'm thinking, it, it's, if, if somebody's going to join, it's going to be my mother. And I don't want to talk to my mother. They're like, if that's how you're going to try to do this, I, I don't. So I, I didn't say anything. But he says, it's, it's a black woman. I said, a black woman? Yeah. And he starts to describe her. I said, Katie Bell? He said, yes, it's Katie Bell. She wants you to know how proud she is of you. And that got me. And you can take it or leave it. You can discount it. You can scoff or laugh at it. But that hit home for me because that mattered. Liz Burdett mattered. Katie Bell mattered. I, I don't I can't have love yeah. for ungiven love. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm cold when you ask me about my mother. Okay, so nothing is. I'm just right. cold. That's I don't have any feeling. You're about cold, it. but you had, but it brought out feelings about yeah. other about somebody sure. else. Yes. Warm, very warm, very warm. Yes. Okay. So I, the, the bottom line is, I, I actually loved my childhood in many ways because it it brought me here, and it toughened me for this. I'm tough. I'm uh, I'm, I'm a survivor. So that's what I kept surviving yeah. until I thrived. So I, I, I have no regrets about it. And I don't regret telling you I have nothing for my mother. She didn't give me much. What do you have for Rick? What would you, what do you hope? Do you still talk to him? At, not regularly, but every once in a while on occasions, you know, for, for an occasion or something. Uh, we had a great talk at, our, at that memorial service for my mom. That was great. I love him. I, I root for him. And every time I pray, I always pray for him. I pray that he doesn't work too hard because I think he's like me. He's got that overachiever gene in him. And I'm thankful for all that he's done because he has done a lot. He got all, He's won the James Beard Award twice for best restaurant and best chef. And my mother told me this. He didn't tell me, but we're going all the way back to early Obama days, the one, he's got several restaurants in Chicago, but the one called Topo La Bampo is, that's what my mom told me, was, or is Obama's favorite restaurant. And it's the one you have to have reservations six months in advance because it's chef's choice where he cooks a lot and you get mm -hmm. served, you, you don't mm -hmm. order, you just get served. So I don't even know much about this, but but Obama does because he loves it. So, and by the way, Obama asked my brother to be the White House chef in his first term. And from, I, again, I get got this from my mother, but we did learn growing up, you cannot be an absentee restaurateur. It, it's, it, it will run over the cliff because people will steal from you and they'll, they, they won't have your standards. So you, you can't go away and think that your restaurants are going to survive because they won't. So he couldn't go because he had too many responsibilities in Chicago. But that's, my little brother got asked to be the White House chef. That's pretty great. So you're proud of him. I'm extremely proud of him because I know better than anybody what he came from because I know what I came from. Okay, and my final question, at mm -hmm. least for this talk, because okay. there'll be another, I hope, All right. um, is who is the real Skip Bayless? Again, you might have a better answer for that than I am. But I want your answer. <sighs> the real Skip Bayless has a big, good heart, and he's very spiritual, and he's he he loves people for what they are and i believe that we're all just little pieces of god who take different shapes so um 
God is very important to me. That's that's the real. I, I have God in my heart. That that would be the best description of me. There's God in my heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Skip. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs>